So first of all, I would like to um, thank the European Commission and uh, the colleagues that I see through the screen for having the OECD. We've been doing great work with the European Commission on the social economy, and I would like also to thank Director Passerman for her kind words at the beginning. Um, so without further ado, and I have to say that Eva has done a great job giving you a flavor of legal frameworks, but also social impact measurement and how these two topics are, ex are extremely linked for, uh, and important for the social economy. And I'm hoping and allow me this little joke that by the end of this day, you'll all find that legal frameworks for social economy are a very sexy topic. So um, let's move on to the next slide. <laughs> so. Let's just before diving into uh, this thin or this beast sometimes that's called legal frameworks, just remind ourselves what uh, the social economy is. Uh, of course, here you might see in the screen uh, that I we always refer to it in the UCD as social and solidarity economy, but I know that in, in the context of the EU, it's social economy. So it's a set of organizations that exist in almost all of your countries, associations, cooperatives, foundations, mutual organizations, and social enterprises and sometimes you even have country level type of organizations that are specific to your countries. They're active in many sectors, we've heard that from Eva. They also promote uh, specific objectives, uh, either social objectives and increasingly um, uh, environmental uh, objectives as well. They, they, they're very well known for being very um, good at uh, trying to integrate specific groups, either to the labor market or to promote social inclusion and other very uh, strategic objectives. They function through uh, specific um, uh, rules. They have a much more democratic decision making making processes, engage stakeholders, and uh, most of all work through for the, 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 the public good. And um, they look beyond um, making immediate profit, but or sometimes even you don't maximize profit at all. They use the surpluses of what they, they have to uh, re-inject in the social mission. And from a recent um, a mapping that we've done, uh, again, through a joint work with the European Commission, uh, we've, and other that, in, that um, encompassed uh, EU countries, but also other non-EU countries, we know that they're often small in size uh, or medium-sized and locally oriented. Although, of course, we know that there are larger ones and we have also uh, some work on that. So this is just, again, just to uh, reset what we're talking about today and who are we uh, um, focusing on. Uh, the next slide, please. So I've, as we've heard from Eva and from, uh, from, I think I'm hoping in the discussion today, legal frameworks is definitely an import policy lever that the countries can use to promote and, um, uh, de and develop the social economy. And this has been, as you know, um, uh, very well uh, stressed and highlighted in different highly important political documents such as uh, and programmatic documents such as the EU action plan back in 2021, the, e, the, the, the OECD recommendation in 2022 and the council recommendation that was uh, um, adopted in 2023. But of course, other organizations, the ILO and of course, the United Nations also refer to legal frameworks as one of the important uh, policy levers. Having said that, once we say that, we need to know and understand better what are these legal frameworks, what do they entail, and how can countries, if they deem them necessary, and I um, definitely agree with Eva, sometimes they're not necessary and countries have to assess the need for adopting legal frameworks before embarking in the legal uh, framework journey. Next slide, please. So, what are legal frameworks for the social economy? I would say that that's the million euro question of today. Uh, it's, it's basically a set, a broad set of legislation that is applied to the social economy. Never mind what's written on the slide because this specific infographic that I find very interesting was written also in another context for a wider context. Let's focus on social economy uh, specifically and not social and solidarity economy. But in, in any case, whatever the context is, whatever the concept is, legal frameworks are always a set of legislation 
applied to the social economy or specific components within it. And they are basically used uh, in most countries to implement policy policy um, uh, policies that are specific to the social economy through what we call obligation and enforcement, meaning it's something in the law, it has to be applied and uh, countries seek to apply it because it's, it has the force of a law. Usually you have two types of, of laws for social economy. You have what we call framework laws, and I'll go into that in uh, other slides. Framework laws that are overarching laws that recognize and promote the social economy, regulate it or both. And I know this sounds very complex, but then we will get to the to the bottom of it. And then you have specific laws, and those, because of the word specific, they are specific, they apply specifically to the entities. So you might have, for instance, and I know that in all of your countries, you at least have one law specific to a legal form, such as cooperatives, because these are the ones that are more uh, where, where you have most of the laws. So you have Associations, for instance, uh, specific laws to associations, specific laws to cooperatives, to foundations, mutual societies, and social enterprises. So once we've said this, it is still um, very important to understand how you go, how you decide to go into uh, design and framework laws or specific laws. Next slide, please. So. This is again, these are again two very important questions before we go into the approaches and the options. Why do legal frameworks matter? So we've heard from Eva and um, I know that in the other workshop I was in, uh, a lot of countries uh, see the value of legal frameworks as a lever to either clarify uh, the social economy or related notions. So sometimes in some context, as I said at the beginning, we, you, you know, countries refer to the social economy or sometimes the solidarity economy or the third sector. So first of all, to cl clarify <clears throat> the concept that's used in the country, raise visibility. That's a very uh, common uh, reason for adopting legal frameworks. And I can give you examples, for instance. So if you take, for instance, the, the 2011 uh, social economy law in Spain, the first article of the law says that and I can read it for you. Um, the the this uh, this um, states that the uh, purpose of the law is to is the establishment of a legal framework common to all entities that are part of the social economy and the promotion measures applicable to them. So it's basically always the issue of having a set of organizations that were not really recognized as such sometimes because operating de facto outside of uh, legal recognition with uh, legal frameworks, the, the clarity and the visibility are, are raised uh, of these organizations. Facilitate access to markets and finance. This sometimes are, sometimes these two objectives are clearly specified in legal frameworks, but not all the time. But these are two elements that sometimes can be found in laws. Or sometimes the law is used as a basis for other measures, uh, such as tax incentives, public financing schemes. <clears throat> and last but not least, it's also a basis to establish cooperation between government agencies and ministries to better coordinate policies. Um, this is a very, very important element because as we all know in the room here, uh, social economy is not a sector, it's an approach to doing things. It's present in different sectors. So it's very important to ensure a common understanding among governmental bodies and agencies. And for that, a law can help a lot. Now, once we say this, <laughs> of course, there are always two sides to the coin. Um, if a law uh, is too restrictive, sometimes it happens it can limit uh, social economy to specific sectors or to specific legal forms only. And this can be a limiting factor or a constraining factor for the development of the social economy. So that's a, a pitfall to avoid and that's a consideration to have when assessing the need or not for a, for a legal framework. Poor design and implementation without stake, stakeholder consultation. So in my uh, modest experience. This is one of the sectors where consultation is a must. 
I think it's extremely important that throughout the process, from the beginning, stakeholders are engaged with uh, the government uh, to def to jointly decide in more or less whether or whether or not there is a need for a legal framework to avoid some of the challenges that Eva hinted to in her presentation too early, not enough. Uh, this, the ecosystem not enough mature, for instance, to receive a law or to accept a law and so on. So the, the issue of design of consultation is extremely important. The third element is uh, legal frameworks take time. They're very complex to develop. So sometimes between the from the time you design and you adopt the law till the time you see the first results of a law, there must there can be a huge delay. So delay to see results due to the complex and time uh, intensive process. These are things to take into consideration. And last but not least, and I'm glad that Eva hinted to that also in her presentation, so she's making my life easier. Um, evaluation in most countries, I have to say that evaluation is the blind blind spot, uh, meaning the evaluation of the law is not something that countries do systematically, whereas it's extremely important to do that because the field evolves. There are new challenges. There are new, new uh, sectors. There are, there are new um, mega trends, and the laws have to be reviewed to um, uh, and evaluated to uh, see whether they're fit, still fit, fit for purpose. And COVID, for instance, was one of the the, the episodes where, for instance, in in if you take the specific example of cooperatives where the general assembly has always been in person uh, if if the law was if if the 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 if there were there were no measures to for instance allow uh, people in uh, members of cooperatives to meet online where where the law is very specific on the in person uh, criteria that would have been very difficult for cooperatives to continue um, uh, being active and proactive throughout the, the, the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So these are elements to take into consideration while uh, thinking of designing uh, a legal framework, but also while implementing a legal framework. So let's move on to the, the other slide. Now, approaches to legal frameworks. As we, as I explained, specific laws are pretty straightforward. They provide the definition for each social economy entity. And they also provide, as I said, legal recognition and uh, visibility. So as you all, in all your country, you, you have at least one law for each specific entity, namely, uh, and you know them, I'm not going to repeat them. So this is, for instance, the approach uh, for a specific laws. You want to recognize, for instance, the cooperatives. So you adopt a cooperative law. You want to recognize associations, you adopt a law on associations and so on and so forth. Now, framework laws, because this is, I think, uh, that was the big ask. For this, we don't have a lot of EU countries that have uh, uh, framework laws. Spain is one, France is one, uh, Greece is one, Portugal is one, Poland is one. Bulgaria also recently, Romania in 2015, as I said. So these are laws and it's tricky. And here I need you really to concentrate with me. Uh, these laws generally define what the social economy is for the purpose or in the context of the country. They might also recognize at the same time uh, entities. And this is, for instance, the case of the Spanish law or the French law. You have three approaches to the adoption of framework laws. The statutory approach, which is the one that defines entities. The substantial approach, which basically defines the principles of the social economy. And then it's, it, it's quite wide, it's quite inclusive. It can include entities that abide by these principles. And then you have the hybrid approach. And most countries, I have to say, use the third approach, which is basically a mix of both. Defining the principles and defining the entities. And all of these approaches come with advantages and disadvantages. 
if you use the statutory approach itself, you may ex exclude uh, social economy entities that are, for instance, or entities that use the principles but are not defined as legal forms strictly. If you use the, the, the substantial approach, it might be very difficult because of the absence of uh, criteria to um, uh, identify uh, to identify what are these social economy organizations specifically. So there is a mix of both uh, is, is maybe the best approach, but even this hybrid approach comes with uh, advantages and disadvantages of both uh, the statutory and substantial approach. So, so it's very important, as I said, uh, before designing the fra framework law to speak with the stakeholders to see what's fit, what is fit for purpose. It might be a mix of both. And I think in my, my personal opinion, uh, sometimes it's 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 uh, the easiest approach to things is to use both to define the principles and also uh, to be very clear on the entities. But sometimes it's not needed. If you have enough specific laws uh, and you define all the each uh, of the entities by a specific law, you might need just uh, a framework law or not that defines the principles. So it's very, very, very important that these things are co-constructed co -constructed with the ecosystem and with the stakeholders. Next slide, please. Now, how do you do this? <laughs> and I'm going to be very trying to be very didactic in this. So roughly, you have to think of four stages in the process. First of all, to assess the need and the relevance of legal frameworks in your own context. Do you really need a law or not? Do you do, does a law, uh, will a law um, create more complexity for social economy organizations or not? Uh, will it limit the sectors uh, where social economy organizations can go into or not? Is the ecosystem ready to, uh, to accept the law or not? These are the very important questions. And in the policy guide that I've shared in the chat, we have specific questions for each of these uh, phases. Second, select legal options. And I will go through them quickly uh, in, in the presentation. Evaluation of the performance of legal frameworks. And of course, last but not least, exchange peer learning. What um, Eva also referred to, and I'm glad that in, in the survey, uh, this is something that came up, the need for training, the need for learning from others, because sometimes some uh, solutions that have been effective in some countries might be adopted, might be useful in, in, uh, in different contexts. So I'm going to go very briefly go through these stages and I'm happy to take questions during the discussion. Next slide, please. So here, assess the pros, the pros and cons of legal frameworks. Again, on the on the right side, uh, on the left side, sorry, you have all the positive implications of a law. You regulate uh, either through specific or framework laws that can uh, can help you raise awareness of the field, give uh, social economy uh, organizations greater relig legitimacy, but also uh, make them more recognizable to potential investors, to potential funders, make them recognizable to uh, pe to organizations and aid government agencies that might procure goods and services from them. So this is very important. It bring clarity also on the boundaries of the social economy, meaning once you define in a law, you demarcate, you say exactly what social economy is and what social economy is not and what are entities that are considered as social economy and those that are not. And um, sometimes, and this is also something that uh, Eva hinted to uh, during her presentation, sometimes you don't need to regulate. The field might be developing organically without outside laws, but you need policy levers. In that case, you need to develop policy levers. And you have also potential secondary effects. I'm not going to go into uh, each one of them, but I'm, the, the presentation will be made available so you can go and see. Uh, and of course, the policy guide is there to for more details. I'm just wanted to give you, for instance, examples of why uh, it's important to assess uh, the, the pros and cons of legal frameworks. I think that countries 
before embarking in this journey have to have a set of clear objectives besides beyond the, the simple uh, legal, beyond the legal exercise in itself. Why should I, why am I creating this legal framework? For instance, in France, it was basically, but that's an overall objective. Of course, there were many, many other objectives of the 2014 law, but basically it was the the overall objective was to create a, a coherent policy framework to support the job creation potential of social economy. And it gave it a lot of tools through the law. In Greece, it was basically also to support the economy after the 2008 financial crisis and to help rebuild and to construct the country. In Luxembourg, for instance, it, it was necess It was to um, recognize specific um, specific uh, business models through the social impact uh, companies, and uh, define them as and give them a definition, make them more recognizable as business models that create economic activity, but with a specific purpose and a specific management. So, and of course, sometimes in other countries. Um, the objectives are can be sector based or um, can be also um, with the objective of creating X amount of jobs or raising the contribution of the sector to the GDP to GDP and so on and so forth. So these objectives have to be clear because otherwise, if it's not clear from the get go, then there is the implementation, the implementation, sorry, might be difficult. Second, uh, the other slide, please. Select the legal options. So here you have different options. You might, countries might feel the need to introduce a new framework law, just a, such as a, a Romania, for instance. You have also examples from outside the EU here, but um, I'm just putting them for a reference. Um, for instance, there was a need um, when Romania adopted its law in, back in 2015 to uh, clarify and recognize the social economy as a whole. And here you have the different approaches that I explained earlier on, the statutory one, the substantial one, or the hybrid one. And again, keep in mind the advantages and the disadvantages. You might decide, countries might decide to introduce specific laws on entities. And this, these laws can either um, uh, introduce new legal forms or recognize existing uh, organizations that didn't have a legal definition or introduce a legal status or certification. Uh, another option is to adjust existing legislation, for instance. And last but not least, you can also decide not to have a law. You can decide not to refrain from introducing a new law, but then to go for different types of measures. You adopt a policy and you bring in other levers. But I have to say that uh, the other levers are needed and necessary, even in the case of a law. You, if, if the law is, was not clear, for instance, on the fiscal trade treatment of or the specific laws are not uh, clear on the fiscal treatment of social economy organizations, you might need to bring in these levers and to explain them very well through uh, policy documents. Uh, next slide, please. Use inclusive and open processes to develop in legal frameworks. I can't stress enough this point. This is very important. This is a sector where you need to consult the others. We need to consult the organizations themselves. And some countries, these are just examples, uh, have used either committees that um, worked for a couple of years before the adoption of the law itself. Some countries like Spain have even developed a partnership model with the umbrella organization uh, that represent the social economy to develop laws and to adjust the law as they go along. Um, and sometimes um, the, 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 the spectrum of the consultation goes beyond the organization the organizations themselves, they, 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 the consultation might include academics, specialists, social entrepreneurs, uh, and so on and so forth. So the wider the consultation is, the best, the better it is, and it's, it's, it's one of the success factors of legal frameworks. Next slide, please. Evaluation. Uh, again, uh, that's unfortunately a blind spot in many countries. Sometimes in some, some countries, uh, the evaluation is, um, uh, uh, is in the law, but not all the time. And what I 
what we found, but we have examples also from outside the EU, when you have the, the exercise of evaluation, it puts you in a position where you re, um, reinitiate the exercise of seeing whether the law has reached its objectives or not on a regular basis. And this is a very good exercise if you need to adjust the law, if you need to uh, repeal a law, if you need to move on and adopt uh, or complement the law with other measures. So the, the evaluation uh, process or the evaluation of a law is extremely, extremely, extremely important for the field of the social economy because this is an evolving field. It's very diverse. So you need to keep your laws uh, always fit for purpose. And for that, you need evaluation. And uh, last slide, I think. Yes, I've included something that I think might be extremely helpful for your countries when thinking of uh, adopting a law. We've designed a checklist. You can literally take this list and you can see it's uh, organized around the four, four, uh, four phases. The scoping phase, which is when you need the questions you need to ask yourself uh, when assessing the need for and the relevance of uh, legal frameworks. And then you have uh, a second set of questions uh, to select the options and involve stakeholders, the development phase, and then the two other um, uh, phases, which are the evaluation and the, ex the uh, peer uh, exchange uh, phase. So I would definitely encourage you to use this checklist because it's, it, checks, it, ticks, it checks a lot of boxes and it goes through the whole cycle of legal frameworks. I'm gonna stop right here. Just one last slide to give you the relevant uh, publications that you might um, you might want to check, but not don't forget the, the EU gateway. It has a lot of information. It's very rich, very well done. Kudos to our colleagues from the, the commission. Here you have um, the publications on policy, on legal frameworks, on social impact measurement, but also I wanted to, to say that we've done about 20 or 21 uh, in-depth reviews uh, of, of, of a lot of countries, and each of these reviews have a legal chapter. So these are also very valuable when you want to learn how uh, legal frameworks, for instance, or not, were developed in, in, in many countries. And don't hesitate, of course, to go to our website. And I'm here to answer questions. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm hoping I'm not, I wasn't too long. <laughs>